This is Sky News. Welcome to our show dedicated to interviewing people who have something to say about the world today. They'll be from politics, sport, business, entertainment, public life, or they'll be everyday people caught up in the events of our times. I'll be putting my questions to tonight's special guests. Good evening. Gordon Brown dominated British politics for a generation, but that was a very different Britain in a very different world. He knows what it's like to be in opposition, to run the Treasury, to run a government, and to help the world out of a crisis, and he still believes he has the solutions. But since leaving office in 2010, things have changed so much. Are Gordon Brown's ideas still relevant? Or perhaps a return to Brown's vision is exactly what his successor, Sir Keir Starmer, needs to lead Labour out of the wilderness. I spoke to him in his only in-depth TV interview to accompany his new book release. One thing's for sure, we do need someone's vision for the economy. Rising prices, falling wages, industrial strife, job shortages, millions still on benefits. I'll talk to Work and Pensions Secretary to raise coffee. She's one of the Cabinet's less known but most thoughtful ministers about the coming storm. Also ahead, a voice from the world's most secretive country. Chi Hun Park grew up in North Korea and was brought up in desperate hardship. Her friend Celine Chai is also Korean, but she's from the South and grew up to be a global banker. They've written a book together with tales of prison, defecting and friendship, and we get to hear their amazing story. The former Prime Minister Gordon Brown was a new Labour leader of the country between 2007 and 2010. Back then, he was considered moody, sometimes angry. I went to Scotland to meet him and find out how he sees the world now. Gordon Brown, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. We're here to talk about your book, Seven Ways to Change the World. But before we get on to that and globalisation and some of the challenges, climate and so on, I did want to talk to you about things closer to home, things affecting people around your home in Fife and in Scotland's central belt, evidence of the cost of living crisis. Can you describe to me what you're seeing at the moment? We've now not only got food banks, we've got clothes banks, we've got uh, bedding banks, we've got baby banks, we've got fuel banks. Uh, we're now in a situation where charity is replacing the welfare state as the last line of defence, the last protection for people in greatest uh, need. And we're about to go into a winter when things are going to get in interminably worse. Mm -hmm. And already uh, the charities that I'm working with locally are preparing for that winter by stocking up blankets, stock, stocking up duvets, stocking up even sleeping bags, hot water bottles, because people are deciding that they can't heat their homes, but they have to find a way to heat themselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the government understands the scale of the desolation and the desperation in communities that they really don't visit. And I think it's up to us to point out that unless you have a plan for this winter and probably to take us through this cost of living mm -hmm. crisis, then millions of people are going to suffer when they could be helped. And at the same time, uh, we're not going to get back uh, to the growth that is necessary to deal with the cost of living problems in the first place. So what we need is a plan. We don't know what the pathway is at the moment. They go from one month to the other. Yeah. The whole purpose of making the Bank of England independent was that they would take a long-term view of the future. And so we need a, a pathway to stable prices. Sounds like you find it a bit frustrating watching what's going on down in Westminster at the moment. Well, I think it's pretty clear what needs to be done. The, the country is being asked to accept uh, austerity because uh, uh, the wage rises that people are being offered are way beyond the rate of, uh, way below the rate of inflation. Uh, public services are, are, are diminishing in, in many respects. There's seven million or so people on health service waiting lists. And there is no explanation coming from the government. There is no plan. They don't seem to have a clue what to do. Now, we have global events that are impinging us. The fuel crisis, obviously, globally. We've got, obviously, uh, food crisis globally. We've got debt uh, facing some of the poorest countries on top of COVID, climate change and conflict. Uh, and there are things that we can do globally and we should be taking the lead. Uh, but equally, uh, you need a national plan and you need to explain it. There should be a television uh, broadcast by the Prime Minister explaining what needs to be done. You cannot go through a winter 
when people are being asked to take the biggest cut in their standards of living for 50 years and not ask people uh, to understand what you're trying to do and give them a plan for what's the, the way through. The government are going to lay out a plan, I think, before summer recess, though. I think they are. Uh, I don't think it will be the sort of plan I'm talking about from what I hear. You've, you've got to think uh, two to three years. Uh, it's got to be about growth because the biggest Achilles heel for our economy is not just the cost of living crisis, it's the failure to grow that means that standards of living have not risen for 10 years uh, and our public services cannot improve. Uh, and so you need to lay out a long-term plan. Now, it should have been in, it, actually, it should have been in Boris Johnson's CBI speech last November when he talked about Peppa Pig instead of talking about an industrial strategy when he lost his, he lost his notes, when he hadn't actually thought through what the consequences of going through this winter were going to be. It should have been in the budgets that Richie Sunak have done. I think he's had three budgets this year already. You think and he should no have plan. a fourth, don't you? Of course, because there's got to be a plan. You've got to explain to people what's happening. Uh, you've got to show how you're going to get back to stable prices. You've got to show also how you're going to help those people in greatest need, the people that I'm very worried about who are going to suffer heavily this winter. But you've also got to show you've got a way through, and that's one, two, three, four years uh, where well, you've got to show people that you've got a plan for growth and a plan for industry. Mm. And it's absolutely clear to me that there is no strategy to do this. And the final thing, of course, we've got to do is repair our trading relations. If we cannot repair our relations with Europe and America, and we're at war, if you like, with both of them for different reasons, but all related Why to... Why are we at war with America? We're at war with America over Ireland, because America will not sign a trade treaty with Britain as long as we cannot sort out, sort out the issues Actually, related to Ireland. President Biden, I asked him about this explicitly um, last year, last September, and he did say that he thought the two things were separate, that there was a trade deal and then there was the Good Friday But He may think issue. that, but the American Congress will not think that. There's no chance of a trade deal between Britain and America unless we can sort out the problems that, that arise in, in Ireland. And, of course, there's no chance of uh, getting better trade relationships with Europe unless we can sort these problems uh, out, out, out as well. And that's very much part of our future, because if we cannot export to the leading markets in the world uh, and cannot do successfully with these new industries and new technologies, then the cost of living crisis will be with us for years and not just temporarily. The consequence of a very tight labour market and inflation has been also a return to trade union militancy, some would say, you might not, but some would say. The government is determined not to compromise on public sector pay. Is that the right stance? Well, what the government's got to do is get people around the table and explain to them what's happening. And look, if you couldn't get inflation down in the next two years from 9% or 11% now to 3 4 or 2%, then you can present people with a programme. You can say to people, here's a package. You're going to benefit later because your wages will rise as long as we can take action now. But there's nothing of this in everything they say. In fact, what the Chancellor is holding out for is the leadership of the Conservative Party by talking about tax cuts all the time. It seems to me, though, in terms of pay <clears throat> rises in the short term, you seem to agree with the Prime Minister. This is what he said to me uh, at Chogham when I asked him about pay rises for public sector workers. He said, what we can't have is a situation in which increases in pay are wiped out by further increases in prices. That's why you've got to be responsible. He, he's right, isn't he, that wage he, increases yeah, could lead he, to an inflationary but, but he's, response. He's, but you, you wouldn't lift yeah, wages to 6%, 7%, 8% yeah, at the yeah, moment, but he, would you? But, but he's talking about a situation where he's trying to allege that some groups of workers are leapfrogging over other groups of workers, that this is a sort of... Uh, uh, traditional wage bargaining round where people are trying to get ahead of others all the time. In fact, everybody in the country is facing a cut in their standards of living. And he's got to explain to people how, if he's asking them to accept sacrifice now, what he's going to do for them to benefit later. So what you might say, you're going to have to take 3% this year, but next year I will try and increase it to X percent or... Well, I'm not going to get in the business of figures because these are parts no, of the nego you, you, negotiation. You actually understand but, this. You're a former but, but chancellor. I'm, you get this stuff but, but as I'm, well as a former prime I'm, minister. I'm saying, if, look, if we could get back to growth, and that would be, let's say, 25 or 3% growth coming out of this, uh, then that's an extra 50 or 60 billion a year for the economy. That's an extra 20 billion of revenues for the, for the exchequer to pay for the things that we, we, need, we need to pay for, including helping people who are in difficulty. And what I think is missing is any sense of the long term. 
you know, th this, is a, this is a prime minister who thinks only from scandal to scandal or crisis to crisis, and it's really sad. You after. don't hold him in much regard, do you? I don't, I don't want to be personal about, I know, that, but about I, these things. I, it's only because you've said a few things about the Peppa Pig and, and not having a plan. I, w I was using Peppa Pig as a... Look, he went to the CBI, and people were expecting him to set out a policy for industry for the future, probably the most favourable audience he, 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 he could get. If I had been there, I would have been setting out my policy for industry and, and, and for growth. Mm. And he not only lost his, his notes and his way, but, he, but he, he definitely lost his way in terms of uh, any direction. And, and, and really, since last November, when we've had three budgets uh, consequent to that, there has been no strategy and no plan. And it's really important for, for any country going through these difficulties to explain mm -hmm. these are global factors that we, we are trying to control, but we're working collectively. Now, it's no good the Chancellor or the Prime Minister saying they're beyond our control. Most of these global forces can be managed by international cooperation. But at home, I think the lack of a plan and the lack of a sense of direction is really what you, is the beginning I, of the I, end the for only, this government. Yeah, my only observation was you don't seem to think he's a very serious guy. I mean, that's the impression yeah, you're, you're leaving you're, me but, with. But, but, Beth, you're trying to get me to be personal about it. These, these are really big issues of I'm not, I just think people watching uh, it will about, think, about, think... about the future of our country. Now, if you ask me, would I have been organising parties in Downing Street? No, and I didn't. And people ask me why there were no parties in Downing Street. But, but equally, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to, no. to, to, to relegate this. This is an issue of policy affecting the standards of living of millions of people across this, this country, also affecting the health service and our ability to finance it, where I think we could do better, and affecting the, the general level of public service. But let's move on to your book and some of the global issues now that you have been thinking quite deeply about the seven ways to change the world. In the book, you identify seven grave dangers that require global solutions. That was in 2021. Now, in the early summer of 22, you've written a new prologue um, of your book, which boils down to three, really, three issues, COVID, climate and war. But isn't what ha is happening now in Ukraine of those three existential issues, isn't it now really that one issue in that there's an argument that says that we can't deal with anything on the social democratic agenda domestically or internationally until that situation in Ukraine is settled, that it literally just blankets out everything else? Well, well, well let me say, first of all, after this shopping centre massacre that has been taking place in the last day and the numbers of deaths, clearly a premeditated attack uh, organised by Putin himself uh, to scare the Ukrainian people. Uh, there is no argument now against uh, holding him responsible for this, uh, bringing him before a, a, a war crimes tribunal, indicting him, and the best way to do that would be to set up a special tribunal now ahead of the International Criminal Court, arraign him for the crime of aggression, which is provable and demonstrable without having to go into a huge amount of evidence about individual cases of war atrocities. Uh, and he should be indicted and uh, he should be charged and even in his absence he should be found guilty and so should the cabal around him. There is, no, there is nothing that Putin understands other than strength. There is nothing he understands other than uh, us showing that we are prepared to stand up to him and that uh, he will exploit every weakness that we show. And I know that from looking at uh, his record and having uh, worked uh, in the time that he was uh, Prime Minister and President and I was Prime Minister. Uh, and I think we've got to send out a very clear message that none of these crimes uh, can go with impunity. So you don't think that there should be a process waiting for... You, you think that there should be an expedited process to charge him as a war criminal? I think uh, that the crime, of, the crime of aggression he is, is obvious. No, I think he does care. But the problem is... Mr Brown, partly, that if you look at how many countries around the world have actually sanctioned Russia, it's 20% of the world. Can you coalesce the world to charge Putin? or The so, world's so, divided so, so, on this. So this is what has happened. We've got NATO unity, but we've got global disunity. So 82 countries either abstained or voted with Russia when they were brought before the Human Rights Council for violations of human rights. As you say, about 150 countries are not imposing sanctions. And the reason, I think, goes back to some of the events of the last few years. Why is it that almost the whole of Africa, the whole of Asia, 
Latin America, Me Mexico and Brazil included in Latin America, much of the Middle East are refusing uh, to impose sanctions or to take any action against uh, uh, Putin. And it's because they feel, first of all, double standards. Uh, I think they feel that we are, we are concerned about Ukraine, but not about civil wars that happen in other countries. But second, that they don't feel, they do not feel that the globalization that has been led by the West is really working uh, in their favor. Going back to Ukraine before we move on, uh, the prime minister's view is that Ukraine shouldn't be coerced into what he would describe as a bad peace. And he's worried that the economic fallout of this war might compel other countries to now try and force or encourage Ukraine into a peace in which perhaps some of the land is annexed. What's your view of that? Do you agree with well, Boris Johnson on that? I, I agree with him about the importance of making sure that we do everything in our power to protect uh, the sovereignty of U U Ukraine. What I think, however, is, is missing here is, is the greater coordination in policy. Now, there's been a huge amount of coordination in terms of the first round of sanctions. Mm. There's been a huge amount of coordination in terms of saying we'll give you this or that military yeah. support. I think Boris Johnson perhaps should spend more time trying to bring people together to agree on what the objectives are for the next stage of this, um, of this enterprise. And of course, we want to support Ukraine. And of course, there is, a, there, is a, there is an issue about where you move from a defensive position, that is, you're helping Ukraine defend itself, to what Russia would see as aggression. Uh, but these are things that I think we've got to discuss together. And I think uh, there, there is a danger that America, Britain, Germany, France, Italy all go in different directions over the next year. Keir Starmer. He is the Labour leader, obviously. The question I want to ask you is, do you think he sealed the deal with the British public in that some of his colleagues, as you will know, have sort of criticised Keir Starmer for being too boring, to quote them. Um, it's kind of a bit true, isn't it? Does, does he come across as a bit boring, a bit loyally, not a charismatic <laughs> leader? But I think every what, criticism, what do you think? Every criticism that has been visited on uh, Keir Starmer was visited on me, Tony Blair, Jim Callaghan, uh, Harold People Wilson. didn't call Tony Blair boring, did they? Yeah, yeah but they, they did say that, that Labour didn't have an exciting enough agenda at certain points. I mean, you remember in 1997, people said it was too modest and, uh, and everything else. But all these criticisms are thrown at Labour leaders. And, and they're mainly thrown, of course, by, by a Conservative press that's got an interest in defeating uh, the Labour Party. Uh, my advice to, to Keir Starmer is usually not to take my advice, because it's better that he does his own thing. But my advice to him has always been not to, li not to listen to this and to get on with the job that he's set himself. One, one to, to prepare the party so that it's seen by the public as a national party that's capable of representing the whole country. Mm. Secondly, to develop his policy. Uh, and third, to put across his policy to as wide a group of people as possible. And that includes talking to no voters in Scotland, uh, as, as yes voters as well as no voters in Scotland. And it includes talking to uh, leave voters as well as remain voters in England. We've got to find a way of bringing this country together. And I think Keir Starmer is better placed to do that than Boris Johnson. Do you think the Prime Minister lacks integrity? Clearly, uh, he, he, he has uh, broken the law. Uh, clearly, he has, uh, he has failed to follow the rules. Clearly, clearly, he's evaded his own ministerial code. All these things are, are true, and I think he's admitted that to be the case. The question, I think, that he didn't quite answer at the weekend is whether he's going to change. Would you have resigned if you were him? at this point? Well, I could, I'll, I'll, look, I'll be honest, I could not have imagined myself um, uh, uh, breaking the law in Downing Street during, during a, a crisis like, like we've had. And therefore, I, I, I could not have stayed in office if I thought I'd let people down in that way. I've got to ask you this, Scottish independence. Do you think that there will be a second referendum in your lifetime or my lifetime? I, I wouldn't rule out that, but I would say that Scotland deserves better than what's happening at the moment. I mean, we're in an endless debate about uh, constitutional details that is leading us nowhere. Uh, I would like to see and I would like to put forward a far more ambitious plan for the future of Scotland, one that uh, solves some of the constitutional difficulties, deals with the economic uh, challenges we face, uh, builds a far better social fabric for this country, and that's really the issue for the people of Scotland. If the issue is posed as change through independence versus no change, and the only alternative is independence, then independence will, 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 will be something that people would be prepared to consider. But if it's one kind of change 
for Scotland staying within Britain, but in a better uh, situation, both in terms of its economic, social and political future, uh, as against independence, then the change that is within Britain will win. Do you think Keir Starmer will be the next Prime Minister of this country? Yes, I do. Do you really? Yes, I do. OK, thank you. Thanks for your time. Gordon Brown there, a former Prime Minister still brimming with ideas, isn't he? Well, look, if you scan this QR code on screen now, you can watch all of our interviews online and all the previous episodes of the show if you so desire. Well, stay with us because coming up next, I'll be speaking with Si Ling and Chi Hung, two Korean women who were raised to hate each other until a chance encounter changed everything. Back, North Korea is one of the most isolated states in the world. For neighbouring countries, it's considered a threat. For the people who live there, that means famine, constant surveillance and strict rules. Chi Hung Park has now escaped North Korea. Si Ling Chai is South Korean. Raised to hate one another, they met in 2014 in a chance meeting and have now forged a friendship and written a book, The Hard Road Out, telling the story of two Koreans. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for joining us today. It's, it's really great um, to meet you both and, and for you to tell the story, which I hope viewers will find interesting. Um, Thank you. You've just published a book, uh, The Hard Road, which you wrote together, which tells the story of, of your life, Chi Hung. Uh, but before we get on to how we met, you met um, and the collaboration, can I start with you? Uh, you now live in Bury with your family, but that's not where your life started, was it? <laughs> yeah. What was it like growing up in North Korea? Uh, when I lived in North Korea, I didn't get any information from outside countries, so we didn't know too much about the, what happened mm. in outside the country. So in North Korea, is called uh, their socialism country, but that is not true. That is a totalitarian dictatorship country. So every morning we wake up same times. Uh, yeah. It's five a.m. Mm. You know, there is uh, the in apartment. It's a captain, it's shouted to us, mm. wake up, mm. so... So almost like being in prison, in a prison room. That, that's true, that is the 21st century uh, is prison in North Korea and also modern slavery lives in North Korea mm. nowadays. When you were growing up there, though, you said that it was very isolated. You couldn't... Um, you didn't know what was happening outside of North Korea. Did you feel unhappy or did you just accept that that was your existence, that was your way of life? Because uh, we are slavery, so slavery is never talked about the future mm. or next moment or something that. So we always are happy with the government. Mm. It's not personal happiness, it's always it's a political happiness. Something happened to you in that you wanted to escape, you fled. North Korea, what, what was the thing, what happened in your life that made you think, I have to leave? Very, very few people ever leave mm -hmm. North Korea uh, and come to tell a story, do they? So how, how did that come about? That is my father's courage, you know. The, my father had been loyal, is a workers' party in North Korea, and he always duty and respected the government. And mm -hmm. he also talked to us. Mm -hmm. When you grow up, you also join the work party and respected the lo your religion. Mm -hmm. But this 1998, that time during this uh, old old March, and three million people died of starvation. This was yeah. the famine. Yes, yeah, famine. Yes. And my uncle also died of starvation in front of me. Your uncle and, yeah, died. And mm -hmm. my younger brother had these problems. So my father last wish was save your younger brother, so leave North Korea. So that time I didn't understand why, but that is my father's courage bring to nowadays my political. So, so you fled with your younger brother <laughs> because of the famine, and yes. your mm. other brother said you must leave the country, your uncle had died. So you fled to China. <laughs> 
basically because you were fearful of the famine and that you would starve. Yes, yes. So you didn't flee for political reasons, you fled for survival. Then what happened to you in China? Once in China, it's language also different, mm. but I never thought about the language problems. First, I met that is a Korean Chinese people, mm. and uh, he lives in not just a big is houses, is kind of is poorest is mm. bungalow, but they have lots of rice, eggs, and meat. Yes. So he gave to us this nice meal. Yes. I was shocking because socialism country is a great country, but China is not a socialism country. But these people is always pull mount the. Eat they, white they, rice, yeah. Well, they, ate, they yeah. had much better food than you. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then you, you had a child in China. What, what happened? Did you have a child in China or you were sent back to North yeah. Korea? What, what happened to you? Because it was the first memory a Chinese person gave to us a nice meal, mm. but not all people nice then to nice us. Yes, so then I was a human trafficking, sold to Chinese men. You were so yeah. How old were you? That time I was 29, yeah. Oh, so that's so horrible. this is not only is my experience, that is all North Korean female and mm. girls' experience. And this is nowadays is a smugglers, human traffickers. Mm. They're waiting the border areas, kidnapping females and the girls. And so you, you were trafficked, <laughs> you were sold to Chinese men and you became pregnant? Yes, yeah. And then you were sent back yeah, to North yeah. Korea? Yeah. So uh, my child was born in China and he was a statelessness child because Chinese government never accepted to, her, to him is yes. in China. And so they never gave to them identifications. So my son was never been to hospital. Did he come back? He didn't come back with you to North Korea? Yes, yeah, he... because he was born in China. Yeah. He's not original North Korean. So, I alone sent back to North Korea because the Chinese government never accept refugees in China. Was it awful? That's awful, and I think people can't imagine what happened inside prisons. When we sent to this political, it, first we sent to the security prison camp, and we went to the today, and the day first this body searching. We just is off all clothes. Cross mm. and the body searched, and that is not a female guy, mm. it's males. And then you were sent back to North Korea and you escaped, <laughs> you escaped for a second time. Yeah. How does that happen? What happened? Um, you know, the first time I lost all family members, my father died in North Korea, and I lost my younger brother too, and I still don't know that my younger brother survived or not. So I lost all family members. So my child is my only family. And I am mother. I have a duty to save my uh, son. So your son is in China? Yes, my you've, son is there. You've been sent back to North Korea yes, and yeah, you yeah. get back to... Yes, so... your, your goal now is I'm going back to my baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so in prison, I only talked about my son. So I just is survival. I have to survive mm. and mm. one day, United my son. Let's come back to the two of you now. Um, Celine, you are South Korean. Mm -hmm. You're together, you've collaborated on this book. Um, how, did, how did you meet and how did this collaboration come about? Um, the, the moment I met her was quite extraordinary. We met by accident. Mm -hmm. I was hired by Amnesty International to translate mm -hmm. an interview because they wanted to do a documentary on her life. Okay. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I grew up in South Korea because my elementary teacher told me so, that North Koreans had red horns on their head that North Koreans were evil, communists, therefore dangerous. Mm. And um, when I found myself sitting in front of her like this, um, here I was thinking, what am I doing here? How am I going to um, justify this to the Korean government? 
Mind you, the two Koreas are still at war. Mm -hmm. There is a national security law mm -hmm. in place that prevents us from engaging with each other. Mm -hmm. I have to report myself to the South Korean embassy, otherwise I'm going to get into trouble. So all kind of things go through my mind. Mm -hmm. So you initially felt quite hostile. Is that fair to say you felt hostile? Oh, it's more than hostile. You were afraid? I was yeah. afraid. I was uh, regretful that I was there. I was shocked, just the stories that she's telling you today. The story in and of itself is shocking enough, but then um, exponentially uh, shocking for me because I had to digest what was happening to me, given the background I grew up with. Yes. Now, my father was a South Korean diplomat. Yeah, so you had to completely and recalibrate everything you thought everything about Everything that I was told was all of a sudden mm. Completely all thrown up, up in the air. So you were fearful of retribution from the South Korean government? Both. I was fearful for both. What do you think could happen side, to you? What, but, North what, Korean what, what side. What did you fear would happen to you? Well, no, a South Korean side, I, I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't do anything against the law. Yeah, so you would be... And, and the North Korean side? Well, North Koreans, you know. Is it the North Korea is the same? We to say that hostile to South Korea and the America as yeah. too. The purpose of this book um, is telling your story, but, I mean, now you've explained that to me, a South <laughs> Korean and North Korean writing a book yeah. together. I mean, that blew that yeah. one apart, didn't it? I mean, so, that's quite politically for people in South Korea. That, that's, this is a massive deal, right? It was right? personally a very difficult um, situation to be in. Mm. But, um, uh, so... Uh, apart from that original trauma, um, with time, not that I turned the page ever, mm. um, this woman changed my life mm. eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I never turned the page, but um, there was this um, desire of um, finding out why is it that I was so, um, so shocked by this event, what is going on, it gave me the envy of exploring a little more this nonsense of uh, two Korean women speaking the same language, um, looking alike, um, uh, eating the same food, living in England, raising families. We, we, we all do similar things, and yet we were supposed to be enemies. Yeah. So I needed to dig into that. Three years along the line, after some couple of random meetings, she approached me and said, would you like to write a my book? Story. <laughs> my yeah. story. I find that there is a line at the mm -hmm. end of the book, without giving too much away, that says, your story is proof that there lies a deep desire for reunification of North and South Korea. Do you think, to, to each of you, mm -hmm. do you think in your lifetimes you, you might see, live to see a united Korea? Um, I would like to say that, not knowing the answer to that, at least there are things that we can do to prepare for an eventual reunification. And um, England is actually the, probably one of the only places in the world where we could be doing something mm -hmm. about this. Because as you know, there are about 800 North Korean refugees living in the UK about 30,000 South Koreans, mm -hmm. and um, we, we can practice living together. Mm. And Chihan, what do, you, what do you think about that? I mean, you grew up in North Korea, now you have Kim Jong-un. Do you ever see a world where there won't be a, a, a totalitarian state in North Korea? Can you, can you imagine it, or do you think it is impossible to achieve. My hope is now is because Britain is joined the Korean War, mm. so Britain is still the empowered country and still the power. So British society have been teaching again to people mm. how is communism and socialism is is but is affected our society mm. and they destroyed our freedoms. So that is could be changed our mind first mm. and then people truthfully looking for what's happened inside North Korea. Mm. Yes. Well, look, hopefully your book, The Hard Road, will begin to tell that story and people will read it and better understand the divisions. Well, thank you both for 
coming and talking to me and thanks for telling me that story. Thank it you. was really a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much Thank for having you. us. Stay with us because coming up next, I'll be talking to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to raise coffee. We're in a cost of living crisis fueled by high food and energy prices. And now there's a labour shortage too, a shortage of people to do the jobs that are needed to keep the UK economy growing. So what are the government going to do about it? Ministers say they have a plan. I met the Work and Pensions Secretary, Trace Coffey, for a bird's eye view of the capital and to find out what that plan is. Trace Coffey, thanks for coming on the show, although we're in a pod not in the studio, which actually I think I prefer. I think I should do all my interviews in here, but anyway, that's a whole different thing. Um, look, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I went back to the last time we did a sit down and I interviewed you, and it was just after the first lockdown. It was in October 2020. You were preparing at the department for potentially four million people unemployed, and at the, at the final quarter of that year, redundancies were the highest level at the highest level on record. You remember it. Fast forward two years. We've now got record unemployment, job vacancies are at record numbers too, 1.3 millions, and we've got shortages in certain sectors. Can you unpack it a bit for me about what's going on? Because the, the market looks quite confusing. Well, of course, when we went into COVID, we didn't quite know what the impact was going to be. Uh, what we did know is that we had to close down significant parts of the economy. Yeah. And in particular, people um, who may be on quite low incomes, so whether it's hospitality, retail. And that's why we prepared and were ready and absorbed, actually, a record number of UC claimants yeah. coming in yeah. who needed help at the time. So fast forward that we recruited people to help people get ready to get back into work. You know, we had a few fits and starts and during the pandemic. But I think what was important was obviously the importance of the furlough scheme. Yeah. So a lot of people stayed attached to their employers. But also, as uh, we started to get vacancies coming, we were well placed, uh, having built that relationship with uh, claimants to get them ready and to get them into yeah. work. But we needed quite a big shove, I think, at the beginning of this year, because we did have record yeah. and still have huge numbers of vacancies. Uh, and we just needed to make sure, learning from what we did with Kickstart, with young yeah. people, getting that right across our entire claimant group. So you've got more people into work, but what people watching will be seeing are shortages in industries. I went to uh, my dad's village in Norfolk uh, over the Jubilee weekend and the local pub had shut down because they couldn't get staff. Aviation shortages, you know, mayhem in airports. Um, what's going on in terms of shortages? Because it's not an immigration issue. If you actually look at the figures, 18% of the current workforce are immigrants. That's the highest proportion ever. So, so what, what's going on? Why are there so many vacancies? Well, we got a half a million people into work in just the last five months yeah. and learning by bringing employers into our job centre, um, making sure that we got rapid turnaround with decisions and uh, coaching people if they hadn't, uh, hadn't been successful. But I think more broadly, what we've seen of the 1.3 million vacancies, quite a lot of those are yeah. high skill. You're right. And uh, that's, uh, we need to keep working now on how we bring people out of economic inactivity. Uh, and that's why I'll be working and I'm working with other departments across government, how we make that happen. Do I don't think need, it is about more do, immigration. Do you need more immigration for certain sectors, do you think? Do you accept that or you don't? Well, one of the things that we have is the Migration Advisory Committee uh, in regards to thinking about high-skilled jobs where we don't have sufficiently uh, enough people. And that was one of the things of leaving the European Union. Yeah. We were able to move to our points-based immigration system. Uh, we have seen a lot of people come into the country. But thinking a little bit more broadly, you know, you were talking about rural Norfolk and aspects of that. What we've done, for example, in I give you a great example in Maidstone and Kent, we brought together farmers, uh, we brought together uh, our claimants, and we actually did some uh, kind of trials, some work coach experience, and we actually started filling jobs in those sort of fruit pressing, uh, picking areas. So we can make it happen by bringing our employers together, and that's been the success of Way to Work. And but but Trace Coffee, in, in terms of where we are now. We've got 1.3 million vacancies, but the other thing that is quite surprising, I find surprising, is that we have 5.3 million people, one in four people of working age in this country, are either unemployed or economically inactive and, and claiming some sort of benefits. That's an astonishing figure. I was surprised by that. What, what, what's going on? 
Well, this uh, also includes people who aren't uh, medically capable of working. It also inc includes people uh, with caring responsibilities. So there'll be a variety of reasons of people who are job ready in order to do that. Um, well, we have seen, uh, we now have a record of 3 million people uh, on PIP, uh, our, our disability benefit. If you think about it, 5.3 million people economically inactive, 1.3 million job vacancies. If you get one out of five of those people back into work, you, you fix the problem, right, without further immigration. Is that your aim? Is that the goal? Well, my focus is on the about 1.4 million people who we pay benefits to who are actively looking for work. And as we've talked about, some of the um, vacancies may not be readily accessible for those people. But when I think about some of uh, where we're trying to fill vacancies around the country, we are also needing employers to be flexible. This is about where we are trying to um, help people who have got some challenging health conditions and how we can help them get into work in a more proactive way. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Beth, there's a number of people who went on furlough, seem to have saved a lot of money, haven't necessarily wanted to go back to the jobs they were doing before. It may be they found a job during furlough, uh, another job which was more to their suiting. But I think we've seen a greater thing of people um, being uh, kind of uh, wanting a different life work yeah. balance. Yeah. People watching this will be thinking about their summer holidays and looking at the baggage claim at Heathrow in absolute horror thinking, is my holiday gonna get messed up because of worker shortages? The airlines are calling out for a temporary visa scheme. Uh, to try and sort out this short-term issue. Would you rule out a temporary visa scheme? The reason I'm asking is because people are watching going, I just want it fixed. You know, I want to go on holiday, I want it fixed. Well, I mean, indeed, but I, I don't believe that uh, the visa route is uh, what is uh, being considered okay. uh, within government. I just know that we are helping people okay. currently who are out of work to find jobs in our airports around the country. ONS figures out today, UK household incomes fell for a fourth consecutive quarter at the start of the year. It's the longest run decline in household income since 1955. Uh, adjusted for inflation, incomes are 1.3% lower than a year ago. Well, look, we know that inflation is high and we know it's having an impact. That's why we responded with the cost of living a payment measure that we've people, taken. Isn't it? I mean, it... But we've added an extra £15 billion. Uh, the first payments will be going out to low income households next month uh, and they'll be staggered throughout the year in how we help people, as well as the money going to every household to help with energy Do you costs. Why is it difficult in your job, though? Because you are dealing with people that are really at the bottom of income scales, that typically that they feel price rises much more acutely than the middle classes because they don't have disposable income. Do you, is, it, is it hard in your job that you think, oh, I can't do enough for people? Well, I do know that one of the best ways I can help them is to help them get a job. Yeah. To really boost their pay packet. But I remember in the pandemic, your department really pushed, for example, the £20 a week on universal credit, that that made a huge difference to people. That was a way you could, it cost £6 billion a year. I mean, would, do you kind of think, if I could, I would put that policy back? I don't anticipate a particular uprating that's uh, linked to £20, but as ever, I will do my annual review uh, later in the year. I interviewed Gordon Brown also this week for the show, and he's a former Chancellor and, and thinks a lot about this too, and he said to me that he's worried that charity is becoming the last line of defence for people struggling instead of the welfare state. What, what's your response to that? Do you think that's an unfair observation as i pointed out we've put together just uh in a matter of a, a few weeks ago or less than two months ago a package of support of 15 billion pounds to help and uh, some of the criticism the of it was that it wasn't targeted enough at those on lower incomes that it wasn't targeted enough like some of the blanket measures like a fuel duty cut six billion 2.4 billion pounds for that but it was well that was part of the earlier package in terms of uh, the 22 billion pounds before okay well let's let's talk a bit now about you um now before you came into politics you were you're a scientist by background aren't you well i did a phd in chemistry but i didn't carry it on in, okay. in work and then you're a businesswoman yeah but did you always want to go into politics were you a young conservative I was a young Conservative. I think I grew up in Liverpool in the 80s, and I'm 50 now, but actually as a child, I did actually have a Conservative MP. People might find that hard to believe. It wasn't for very long. And then um, I felt my home city of Liverpool was ruined by militant Labour, 
you know, the, the analogy I can see with momentum today and recently is, is very, um, very clear. And I just realised that politics mattered. Uh, both my parents were teachers. They were the gang, part of the gang that received their redundancy notice, which was then repealed. And I remember at the time saying to my mum, this is like really worrying. She said, oh, don't worry, it's some trick so they can, we'll all, get, we'll all be fine. And I just thought that's not the way to run my city. And I actually thought Margaret Thatcher was doing a great job in the rest of the country. So I got engaged. I didn't know that. I didn't know you were from Liverpool, actually. You haven't got a Liverpoolian accent at all. I can turn on the accent. Ah, OK. Way. I went to Paris for the, uh, for the uh, Champions League final. So it was did great. Did you? I did. So I didn't know this about you. I okay. tell you, getting into the stadium, it's like being in a mosh pit that wasn't well, very wasn't pleasant. It, wasn't it? But, uh, wasn't it? Was it loads of aggro there? Did you get it? In, was, did, did you, I, I don't think it was very well handled. Did but, you uh, find? Did you have any troubles up there? Were you okay? Absolutely. I wasn't what pepper sprayed, happened? but uh, that was part of the squash. Honestly, it was like being in a mosh pit where you didn't want to be. Oh, were no, you it wasn't frightened? great. I wasn't frightened, but it was uncomfortable. Oh. But nevertheless, it was. Um, it wasn't even a great result for us. The other thing that I know about you, but lots of people might not know about you is that you're also a devoted Roman Catholic. Now, in terms of your faith, does it affect your or guide political decisions for you at all? Or is it something that you keep for Sunday only? Is it, is, do, you, do you separate those things out in your life? Well, I don't, work in life? I don't think I wear my religion on my sleeve, so to speak, but it's undoubtedly a part of who I am. Um, and I hope that comes through in a lot of the ways that we try and help people in my role as Secretary of State. We want to be compassionate and considered in what we're doing and helping some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are other issues which get decided in Parliament on great ethical issues of the day. Uh, and so, of course, I'll participate in that. Uh, but I'm a Democrat as well. And I just realised we're coming down, so I'm going to jump to this straight to this question. Just in terms of women's rights, Roe versus Wade, uh, last week, the Supreme Court of America effectively ended the constitute rights to abortion for millions of women across the US. The PM said it was a move backwards, step backwards. What did you think about that? Well, it's a US Supreme Court decision. In this country, Parliament's legislated to allow access to abortion. Uh, there, it's a different uh, debate, uh, federal uh, versus uh, uh, states. And the Supreme Court have come a, a different decision on who should decide that. Is it the courts or should it be legislatures? We already have this situation, so abortion law isn't going to change in this country. People will still have access to it. Jacob Rees-Mogg, the reason I asked was he, we were taught, he's obviously a, a, a Catholic too. He told me that the number of abortions in the UK he thought was one of the saddest aspects of British modern life. Do you, do you agree with that? I think there's a number of things where people either give up hope or don't think they can cope with certain things uh, in a broad uh, variety of way. Um, of course, I would prefer for people didn't have abortions, but I'm not going to condemn people that do. And would you like to see the right to abortion enshrined in British law, which is now the live debate? We don't need it because we already have legislation that provides access to abortion. And just finally, you've uh, been described as one of the fully paid up human beings in public life. You like a drink, you like a bit of karaoke, you occasionally like a cigar. Um, that's your way of letting off steam, is it? What's your signature track? Oh, gosh. I don't know, it keeps changing. One of the, uh, we're having a great time. At the moment, it's Shower and Becky G. Okay. There we go, dancing in the mirror, okay. singing in the shower. But no, that's a slightly different thing. Look, a few years ago, I was pretty ill. It's reinforced my joy for life, and I'll keep living life to the full. But I'm a professional, always get the work done. Yeah. Well, that's all for tonight's show. Thank you to all of our guests, Therese Coffey, Celine Chai, Chaham Park and Gordon Brown. And thank you for taking time to watch us.